I grew up watching a Spongebob movie, and it never occurred to me that during the battle between Pixar, DreamWorks, and several others, that Nickelodeon movies was a contender. Although before my time, Rugrats was popping out movies left and right, and I do remember watching Good Burger, but I had no idea it was a theatrical release. I enjoyed Barnyard, Nacho Libre seems like a fever dream to me, and I've heard great things about Rango. So with all of these bangers underneath Nickelodeon's belt, there lies the what ifs, the tragic stories, the mysteries that even today, I can't answer. Here lies the cancelled movies of Nickelodeon. August 11th, 1991. Nickelodeon would premiere three separate shows that had three dramatically different journeys. Doug, Rugrats, and The Ren and Stimpy Show. Those lips, those eyes, that gosh awful sound. It could only be Ren and Stimpy. You'll live joy. The latter of the three, Ren and Stimpy, went on to have the most explosive growth at its start. For those of you who don't know, Ren and Stimpy was the edgy child of the trio, sporting crazy and dark violent tones, over the top often gross close-up shots, and these incredibly humorous animations laid over rather simple stories. 47 million dollars! <coughs> I'm the cat! <laughs> If you were to tell me that this was a show for adults disguised as a show for children, I would believe you. Matt Groening, creator of The Simpsons, even called the show the only good cartoon on TV other than The Simpsons. Mike Judge, who worked on King of the Hill, credits the success of Ren and Stimpy to how he got his foot through the door working on Beavis and Butthead for MTV. Despite all of that influence, the show nowadays is mostly spoken about in relation to its creator, who will be important later. Nickelodeon, in an attempt to branch out into the wacky world of movies, would sign a two-year deal with then 20th Century Fox to make films, as at the time, they had the successful IP, but not the finances to work with. It should be noted that Ren and Stimpy was not explicitly stated to have a movie, but rather the concept was on the table, especially given how doggone popular it was. But then Man's Best Friend happened. <sighs> Within 1992, Nickelodeon was to air an episode from the second season of Ren and Simpy titled Man's Best Friend, but pulled it from its airing. Although now we know exactly what the episode featured given its airing in 2003 on Spike TV, airing a few days before the infamous Ren and Simpy adult party cartoon, which is why you're seeing what you're seeing on the screen here. At the time, it was considered too far even for Ren and Stimpy. While Nickelodeon enjoyed the success the show has brought, making this cartoon venture both profitable and admirable, they allegedly felt like if they were to continue to go down this route, this show may affect the other shows on the network, or the network itself, both optic-wise, but also legally if the show's complaints were anything. They had two choices, continue the show and risk whatever comes with that success, or stop it right then and there. Except that's not true, because contractually, they had to continue the show, but they didn't need John to do it. John even speaks about it in an interview. That's the banned episode of Ren and Simpy that is aired on Spike, but not everyone has seen it. And that's a pretty good crowd pleaser. That's the famous George Licker episode that got us all at Spumco fired from the Ren and Simpy show. However, that's not the full story. According to a story published in The Courier in 1993, it alleged that Ren and Simpy episodes were delivered months late or not at all and also accused John of sneaking in unapproved material. The crew has responded that Nickelodeon executives would often change things very late in the process, or just in general be very difficult to work around. This led into Nickelodeon letting it be known that they'll produce the show themselves, and anyone who was working on the show underneath the studio at the time, Spunko, except John, could continue to work at the show, although a lot of people did leave with John. Bob Camp, one of the co-founders of Spumco, would become the showrunner of Ren and Stimpy, obviously not leaving with John, and as the article states, they never spoke since. Fun fact, one of the people who didn't decide to leave was one young Vince Waller, aka Vincent Waller, the current showrunner for Spongebob, among many other things. You are a true champion! Whether it be because of the optics of the show or because it was more trouble than it was worth, all we know is that around this time, Viacom would purchase Nickelodeon alongside Paramount Pictures, a direct competitor to Fox, 
and thus the deal expired, meaning that if there was an animated Ren and Simpy film, it wasn't going to go forward. Bob Camp would speak about doing another Ren and Simpy movie later down the line. We actually pitched a Ren and Simpy movie to Paramount, and they wanted nothing to do with it. Adult party cartoon poisoned the well, I think it left a sour taste in everyone's mouth. I had nothing to do with that one, and now someone at Paramount doesn't want anything to do with Ren and Simpy. On the opposite end of the spectrum was a calm and introspective Doug, who quietly took the nation by a moderate shower. The show was not as popular as his counterparts, Rugrats and Ren and Stimpy, despite arguably being remembered more fondly today. I doing wrong? I guess if kids had to pick between the wild, edgy, controversial, but really funny type of entertainment and the calm, moral-driven, slow-paced, well-meaning type of entertainment, they'll always pick the former. Some things never change. However, Herb Scannell, senior vice president of programming for Nickelodeon, was really hot on Doug, stating that what separates Nickelodeon from its competitors was that it gives children credit for quotes being sophisticated enough to want more than two-dimensional characters and simple plots citing quotes, the gentle trials and life lessons of early teen Doug. And if that wasn't enough, he'd later speak about how he's not trying to do quotes, Xerox television, and quotes, making five spinoffs of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. <laughs> Despite the fact nowadays that they would make five spin-offs of Spongebob, this article is actually two years after the first one, and within this same article speaks about the purchase of Doug via the acquisition of Jumbo Pictures, a studio that produced Doug, to Disney, which moved Doug to ABC after its fourth season, and Doug continued to produce episodes for an additional three seasons. We know now that Doug would receive a movie, Doug's first movie, which served as the finale of the series in 1999. However, like with Ren and Simpy back in 1993, there were talks of Nickelodeon wanting to produce movies based on the animated program it had at the time, so again, if they were making a Doug film, like if they were making a Ren and Simpy film, between the deal with Viacom ruining their deal with Fox financing any movies, but also Disney's purchase of Jumbo Pictures, it wasn't gonna happen. As we move on to the next section, allow me to introduce my friend, Crit, who's the biggest Bone fan that I know. Back in the days of Scholastic Book Fairs, you had a variety of options on what books you could buy. There was the classic Captain Underpants books, Super Fly Guy, and the beloved set of graphic novels, Bone. Starring a group of creatures called Bones, Phone Bone, Smiley Bone, and Phony Bone are three cousins that end up run out of their hometown of Boneville thanks to some shady business deals on Phony's part. They find themselves in a valley where they're caught up in the middle of an upcoming war of dragons, rat creatures, and dreams. Imagine Lord of the Rings, but made so kids could understand it while not talking down to them. The series resonated strongly with young adults and received praise from the likes of Matt Groening, Frank Miller, and Neil Gaiman. The initial series ran for nine volumes with a prequel novel Rose, two sets of sequels called Tall Tales and Quest for the Spark, two point and click adventure games, and most importantly, a potential movie deal that fell through. In the late 1990s, writer and artist Jeff Smith had shopped the movie rights to Nickelodeon movies to produce a film adaptation. However, the overbearing demands of the studio made Jeff Smith retract those rights. Demands such as the bones being voiced by children despite them all being adults, phone bone wearing magic gloves that he never had in the original series, a Britney Spears song, and an overall more kid-friendly childish tone that clashed with the somewhat kid-friendly but still mature storytelling of the comic. Between this, a failed movie deal with Warner Bros, and Netflix canceling the planned series, it seems Bond is destined to live on purely in comic book form. Imagine a cartoon about the life of an alien trying to teach a caveman regular things from boxing to the wheel and even ice skating, but each time it goes horribly wrong. Thanks to a monkey, that is Prometheus and Bob. <laughs> Kablam! was a staple of many childhoods within the 90s, being a sketch comedy series which served as a showcase for different forms of animation, including stop motion. Presented in a mock government format consisting of a narrator introducing the tape, the segments are often short, consisting of one still shot, but not always, and usually result in Prometheus, the alien, injured in some slapstick sort of way, but having the patience to teach Bob, the caveman, a new thing within the next tape. Despite its simple format, a lot of people remember this segment fondly, if not for its uncanny art style. <laughs> Albie Hecht, president of film and television entertainment at Nickelodeon, would push forward a live-action theatrical release of this concept here, claiming that since, quote, 
Prometheus and Bob, has already proven itself in one medium, we are confident that this comical cartoon short will translate well into a full-length family feature. They were really looking to hire major stars for this project, hoping to capture the same success as the Beavis and Butthead movie, those stars being Chris Farley and David Spade. Unfortunately, Chris Farley's struggle with substance abuse would be the cause of his death, and according to the creator of Prometheus and Bob, Code Zellers, the producers working with this movie pitch would not only send it to Nickelodeon anyway, months after Farley's death, but also produce what he felt was the worst script ever. And then a script was written that was just horrible. They asked for my input, and I was like, this is the worst thing I've ever read. And I went into great detail about that. They wouldn't let me write the script for some reason. I had a several ideas. Although there was promise to the idea, it fell through for what appears to be a variety of reasons, and despite Zellers wishing to work with the idea more, apparently one contact at Nickelodeon said that this will never happen. Every once in a while, I call Nickelodeon and ask them when are we going to do a modern Prometheus and Bob. One person told me it will never be made. <laughs> Everybody else seems to just humor me, so. Wow. You befriend a cloud, and you are whisked away to another world. Sector 7. This wordless book captured both the hearts of many, but also a Caldecott honor. The premise is incredibly imaginative, so it would fit perfectly in the world of animation, which is what Nickelodeon, Pixar, Itsy Bitsy, among others felt. Nickelodeon got the deal for quote, low against mid six figures, and that's about all we know. The movie is either cancelled or in development hell. Half man, half ghost. And no, this is not Danny Phantom, but Dexter Mungo, better known as Ecto Kid, a short comic series that ran from 1993 to 1994, across the Barkerverse, a universe of four titles created by Clive Barker. The idea was that his father was a ghost, but his mother was a mortal psychic. And through his right eye, he sees the world just how you and I would. But through his left eye, he would see the Ectosphere, a different world full of creatures that come straight out of nightmares. This book came out during the height of the comics boom that things were starting to decline right about this time. And this series actually became a victim of the comic boom and bust. You'll notice when you pick this one up that it has a foil embossed cover and a 250 cover price. 250 was ridiculously high for that time, but Marvel was not doing well financially and they were pulling out all these gimmicks to try and get an extra buck. And it worked for a little while. Unfortunately for this book, by the time this came around, people were getting sick of paying two, three, four times the price for one book. Nickelodeon would pick up not just the film, but the TV rights to Ecto Kid, in which he anticipated back in 2002 would take an additional two to three years of development because it was an elaborate movie. Clive had high hopes with this project and his relationship with Nickelodeon. However, there hasn't been any information about it since. Similar to Sector 7, this movie never really materialized past the pre-production stage. And that's the last that we heard of it. I'm a big fan of Jimmy Neutron and even went back to watch the entire movie before seeing exactly what happened with this supposed sequel. Although painfully stuck in the late 90s despite being released in 2001, the movie follows the young titular character and his quirky super genius. After releasing a satellite that reaches alien life, said aliens would abduct his parents alongside the rest of the children of Retroville, and it's up to them to get their parents back. Oh, that looks great, Carl. Thanks. Uh, what are you trying? Fly cycle modifications for Goddard. Second prototype. Prototype, huh? Uh-huh. Oh, well, you know, that looks good too. The success of this movie not only got an Academy Award nomination, which was the first year that animated films were even given their own award, but also made back their money triplefold, and also led into an animated television series that some of us know very well. But did you know that there was talks of a sequel? Despite critical pushback against the concept of 3D animation, with some alleging that Toy Story and Shrek will look very dated by the year 2015, but that Snow White will still inspire awe, 3D animation within the animated movie sphere was here to stay, and Jimmy Neutron proved the success across different verticals. When asked about the rumblings of a sequel, co-founder of DNA Productions, Keith Alcorn, had this to say. There was a sequel in the works, but we couldn't agree on a story. Plus, once a TV series came out, there wasn't a lot of incentive to make a movie when fans could simply watch Jimmy at home for free. If only they knew that in a few years, one sponge, who was on TV for free, would do this not once, not twice, but three times, with the fourth time in development. Although he acknowledges the success of then-recent Nickelodeon comeback 
movies, Invader Zim Enter the Florpus, and Rocco's modern life static cling, he is waiting for the right moment for the perfect comeback. This next one is the most mysterious of them all. Nickelodeon Movies would announce a live action animation hybrid. A boy and his imaginary friend who takes him from the real world to an animated fantasy world. It's incredibly vague and it doesn't help that there is a movie called Imaginary Friend and that's not the one I'm referring to, but also it doesn't help that there is an animated thing in the world that exists that features imaginary friends that I'm sure a lot of you know about and I'm not speaking about that either. I don't know what this is referring to and it's completely up in the air as to what happened to this movie, all we know is that it existed at some point. We stray away from the animation world to the world of live action. Now, I wasn't the biggest fan of live action then, or now, so this slipped under my radar. Lemony Snicket, pen name for the author Daniel Handler, would write a series of children's novels, a series of unfortunate events in which Nickelodeon would pick up the rights for. This leads into Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, Nickelodeon's biggest budget for a movie, but also biggest box office, at least at the time. Now, one looks at numbers like this and see that they didn't even double what they've made compared to the Spongebob movie, which came out a month earlier, and made back nearly five times the amount. But the vice chairman of Paramount Pictures looked at the concept and thought of it to be their Harry Potter. Yeah! No. Daniel Handler, writer of the books, had this to say about the sequel. Believe it or not, a sequel does seem to be in the works. Paramount has had quite a few corporate shakeups, widely documented in articles I find too stupefying to finish, which has led to many a delay. Of course, many, many plans in Hollywood come to naught, but I'm assured that another film will be made. Someday. Perhaps. Given that last year Warner Bros went through a corporate shakeup and many plans fell wayside, it is safe to say that the Lemony Snicket sequel was not a priority. Although Lemony Snicket has been writing books still to this day, due to the past of Daniel Handler, I'm going to assume that squeaky clean Paramount doesn't want to work with that anymore. Imagine you lived your life, the child of dull, collecting accountant parents, and one day, the nurse who delivered you confesses that you were swapped at birth. You learn that you're a part of the anybodies, humans with shape-shifting powers. And that's just the tip of the iceberg for the best-selling fantasy novel, The Anybodies, written by anybody. See what they did there? The pen name for Juliana Baggett. Similar to Lemony Snicket, Imaginary Friends, and a few others on this list, Nickelodeon basically wanted to get into creating these wondrous, imaginative movies from best-selling children novels. Novels. According to one source, The Anybodies was set for a release in 2006. However, we've heard nothing about it since then, especially given that what was released in 2006 was Nacho Libre, Barnyard, and Charlotte's Web. It's safe to assume that The Anybodies isn't being produced anymore. Although we know of Fairly Odd Parents to have several specials in films, from Channel Chasers and Abra Catastrophe to the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour series to the live action Fairly Odd Parents specials, apparently there was going to be a theatrical release pitch that Nickelodeon was potentially going to accept. The sole source of this, though, comes from Butch Hartman and his podcast, Speech Bubble, in which he details writing two scripts, in which the former was about Cosmo and Wanda having a baby. Now, to some savvy fans, they may think that this was Fairly Odd Baby, but in theaters. They would be mistaken. The script was made before Fairly Odd Baby, and it was different in its original form, having something to do with the baby named Dusty, named after Fairy Dust. The other idea was that it featured an origin story of Fairy World, and how Jorgen lifted part of the Earth into the sky. I think the lady who was behind it at Paramount at the time left Paramount, and so usually when someone like that leaves, all their projects go with them meaning go away because <laughs> the new person coming in wants nothing to do with the old person stuff. They don't, they don't want to be like, the old person has a project that's bad. They don't want to be tarnished by it. So it's just sometimes the way things happen. And you know, no, no hard feelings or anything. It's just one of those things where it didn't happen. If there was a conversation about the best Nicktoons, Avatar is up there, without question. The three books are considered some of the best examples of world building, storytelling, and animation that Nickelodeon has to offer. So of course, you would think that it would lend itself to an amazing movie. The Last Airbender, is not that amazing movie. In fact, The Last Airbender is as bad as Avatar is good. So basically, it's one of the worst films ever made. Between the casting, writing, visual effects, acting, and so much more that can't be condensed down into this one section, this movie bombed every way except financially, making a near 320 million worldwide with an 150 million budget. It was planned for The Last Airbender to be a trilogy, which makes sense conceptually, one movie per book, but because of the disastrous execution, Nickelodeon cut their losses and scrapped the trilogy for good. 
Unrelatedly, there is another film in the works set to be released October of 2025. In 2004, Nickelodeon released a press release announcing three movies in development, the Spongebob movie, Barnyard, and Mighty Mouse. We know of the first two to be released, but not the last. If you don't know, Mighty Mouse dates back to the 40s, being a homage to Superman in the form of a mouse. Although in the past the theatrical shorts didn't do as well, it was when said shorts aired on television within the 50s that the mouse gained notoriety as one of the most recognizable characters during the Saturday morning cartoons era. This falls in line with the classic formula that Nickelodeon Nickelodeon has, take something that worked either in another medium or another decade and bring it back. There wouldn't be much of a pulse to this property, but we would get another article from Cartoon Brew in 2006 showing off some of the pre-production art, led by Neil Beck, a super fan of Mighty Mouse. He'd also be an active fan, sending messages to Viacom about their treatment of the Mighty Mouse franchise. To the people in charge of Mighty Mouse licensing, I know that I speak for all of the Mighty Mouse fans out there when I say thank you for having an interest in producing a Mighty Mouse movie. However, I must say this. Mighty Mouse must be seen before this movie comes out. Holding off of anything else for Mighty Mouse till the time of the movie is not a good idea. You should promote him, and the sooner the better. All in all, your property, Mighty Mouse, has a long and proud history. I know that this movie shall be a great success, but to have even more success, the star really should be seen before the movie. Smiley face. Although genuine and heartfelt, the business end was a lot more cold. When Viacom split into different companies, one company, CBS Opera, Operations owned, quote, the ancillary rights and trademarks to the character, and Paramount Home Entertainment slash CBS Home Entertainment owned the home video rights. It appears that corporate legal meddling was a factor in what's taking so long for this. Sifting through archives, I've managed to snag a few other similar looking pre-production art. Fast forward to 2010, and there would be no news about it, except that there's a new writer and director that are being sought by Paramount, and that's where it ends. Except it doesn't. As recently as 2019, Paramount Animation picked up the project again and is currently being worked on, turned into a live action animation hybrid film. So there is a moderate chance of all the movies listed here that this one actually may see the light of day. Similarly to Mighty Mouse, The Adventures of Tintin dates back well into the previous millennium. Unlike Mighty Mouse, The Adventures of Tintin did become a movie, and it did so well that it remains one of the highest grossing movies of Nickelodeon's history. The history for this possible sequel is a bit confusing, so hear me out, I'm gonna try to make it as simple and easy to follow as possible. When a sequel was planned, a lot of the conversation was about which one of the comic albums, yes, comic albums, it was going to model. There are 24 canonical Tintin comic albums, in which the first movie takes a lot of inspiration from The Secret of the Unicorn, The Crab with the Golden Claws, and Red Rackham's Treasure. Several potential comic albums floated around them. The Seven Crystal Balls, Prisoners of the Sun, The Caculus Affair, and The Black Island. Sometime between the release of the first movie in 2011 and a year after, the sequel's source material had been chosen but not announced. The only thing that was announced was that everyone was aiming for a release date around 2014 and 2015. However, in 2016, Anthony Horowitz, screenwriter for the possible sequel, announced that everything was scrapped and started over from scratch basically. While the director-producer duo Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson were working on the idea, they would delay it with the latter of the two wanting to finish working on The Hobbit as well as a few other films within the meantime. Now as we leap forward in 2018, both Spielberg and Jackson stated interest in working on that idea, but still say that it is a script that hasn't been written. However, the former, Spielberg, would assure the audience that Tintin isn't dead. As you can tell, the theme is, other projects were more important, so this one wasn't really a rush at the moment. In 2017, according to the media, the biggest reliever was that there was going to be a third Spongebob movie, if only they knew. However, tacked onto this press release was the announcement of the Loud House movie and a Henry Danger movie, you know, the two other properties that did amazingly against Spongebob's generational dominance. Now, if you don't know, Henry Danger revolves around the life of 13-year-old Henry Hart, who lives a secret double life as a superhero, alongside Captain Man, who trains Henry, and he also has to keep this a secret, basically. I want you to know, from the little that I watched, watched of this show, when I saw that his crush didn't like Henry, but liked the superhero side of him, I was like, oh my god. If there's any live action show of recent time to talk about on the channel, I need to see how that entire arc goes down. The source of this news would mainly come from then president of Nickelodeon, Saima Zargami, and I really hope I'm saying that correctly, who championed these three shows as, quote, competing with Disney. Now, if you've been paying attention, these canceled movies come from one of three circumstances. Either another company either purchases the 
the deal that allows for them to make movies or outright purchases the entire thing, Nickelodeon gets cold feet on the idea, or management changes means that all of the old ideas are gone and now they're focusing on the new. As you can tell, Henry Danger didn't get purchased and was treated relatively well compared to its animated and live action counterparts. So you guessed it, after Saima stepped down in June 2018, leading into Brian Robbins, aka the Spongeverse leader, succeeding her as president. He wasn't as keen on a Henry Danger movie. So with the departure of creator Dan Snyder, also in 2018, and with the adventures of Kid Danger doing incredibly poorly in 2018, it was heavily assumed that Nickelodeon did not want to risk doing such a large-scale movie in favor for safer or more profitable ventures, like the Smurfs. Except that's not fully the case. According to articles as Recently as 2022, Jace Norman, who plays Kid Danger and also Henry, signed a pact with Nickelodeon and Awesomeness TV to work on new content, which most likely includes a new live action movie for the series. So this idea may not be completely out of the water. Are You Afraid of the Dark, like Kablam, was a staple of 90s Nickelodeon, albeit lesser talked about compared to Ren and Stimpy, Doug, or the Rugrats, but when it was revealed that an Are You Afraid of the Dark movie was slated for October 11th, 2019, fans all over were excited to see the anthology series come back in a major way. However, articles as late as December of 2018 were speaking about how a director wasn't even locked in yet, and it seemed like this was going to be another story about a movie idea that fans got excited about and it had little spark to the fire. However, of all the entries so far, Are You Afraid of the Dark appears to have the happiest ending of them all. Fans weren't greeted to a movie on October 11th, but an entire revival of the series. It was deemed a rating success very early on, which led to more seasons being made, as recent as 2022. Imagine thinking that you're going to get a movie and get a fully fleshed out series, albeit fewer episodes than its 1999 revival or original series, but it's new material nonetheless. We lead to our finale, Rugrats, which may be a bit confusing as to why it's on here so late, given that there were Rugrats theatrical movies, specifically three. However, we aren't speaking about the 1991 series, but rather the 2021 series. We know now that it's just a series, but in 2018, Rugrats was being promoted as both a series and a movie, but not just any movie, a live action movie with CGI characters. I'm glad they just gave us a series, but it does make me wonder, well, what happens in a movie? Well, around a year later in 2019, Paramount would get cold feet and swap the release date of Rugrats with another movie. Rumble, the collaboration between Paramount Animation and WWE Studios, two companies that are connected to larger parent companies that have a hard time sticking to commitment recently. It appears since it's been about like two years that we aren't going to be getting that live action CGI hybrid movie and thank God. And those are all of them. I had a blast working on this video, but the true question is what's next, Pixar or DreamWorks? 